us a chance to pray. Uh, Lord, I know we just prayed, but I, I again want to come to you asking for your favor and ask that you would help us to understand this word that's about to be read. Uh, Lord, again, as we come here to uh, continue in our study here in Acts, uh, Lord, I understand it's Father's Day, uh, and I understand this is also the message that you've laid on my heart as we go uh, systematically through this, this book. Uh, Lord, help us to see that evangelism is very important in the early church, but it's also important within the local church today. Help us to see, even in light of Father's Day, that evangelism is not some far out thing or something that we go do outside the home, but instead it begins in the home. And so, Lord, help us as we uh, look at this passage, help us to uh, to internalize your word in such a way that it, it, it really does play out in our life, that uh, the importance of evangelism. And, and Lord, I encourage those that are here this morning or may hear online, uh, encourage those that are not practicing evangelism, uh, they, they know about it, they, they know what it is, they know it's important, but They've not taken the necessary steps in their life to implement it. Uh, help us as fathers today that you would continue to equip us to train our children. Uh, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, guys. So we're here in Acts, and we're picking up where we left off last week in Acts chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Acts 15, and we're going to start reading again where we left off last week in verse number 36. Acts chapter 15, and we're going to start reading in verse number 36. And the Bible says this, And after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with, with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them to the work. Now we're in verse number 39, guys. Acts chapter 15. It all says, And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now we're at... Chapter 16, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were, who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their, their way through the city, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. Verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of... Now, I, I've learned to pronounce this in church one way. But I, when I began to learn how to correctly pronounce it this week, it was completely different. It's Phrygia. That's how you, how you pronounce that. It's pretty crazy, right? So that's not how I grew up learning it, but that's how it's actually pronounced. And Galatia, having been forbid, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of uh, Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to, pre to preach the gospel to them. Now, you may be sitting here this morning saying, I don't know how to pronounce these words. I don't know where they're at on a map. Well, that's okay. That's why we're here this morning. So, as we look at this particular passage of Scripture, we're reminded that God has given the church her mission. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, 
uh, and some of you guys know this by heart, Christ gave the church her mission, and the Bible says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is the church's mission. Now we, here at Raymond Baptist Church, summarize the Great Commission in three simple words. We summarize Matthew 28 in three words. It is, and I want you guys to repeat after me, it is to... Right. So here at Raymond Baptist Church, we summarize the Great Commission in reaching, teaching, and encouraging. Now, I don't think there's a person in this room that would say that evangelism is not important. You could travel to many different churches. People know evangelism is important. It's important to reach, to teach, and to encourage. Now, there's many different ways that we reach out as individuals. Some people like to uh, go about evangelism in a lot of different ways. Some people like very complicated evangelism. Some people like very simple evangelism. Some people like to be involved in big evangelistic efforts, such as the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Uh, they like to participate in these crusades. But some people are the opposite. They enjoy participating in evangelism one-on-one. -on -one. So maybe it's sitting at the Daily Grind there in Brandenburg, sharing a cup of coffee with someone, and talking to them about the Lord. There's, there's many different ways people go about evangelism. There are thousands and thousands of different books, blogs, videos, training resources on how to do evangelism. In fact, you can sign up for a small fee of, well, it's actually not a small fee, a large fee, and you could travel up to Louisville and you could take seminary classes on the different ways to do evangelism. Uh, some of you guys have went through these classes. There are... If you were to walk out of this door right here in the back of the church and turn to your right on the wall there, there are over 20 different gospel tracts in which you can hand out for evangelism. Did you guys know they were there? There's gospel tracts in the back. The point is this. There are many different methods. There are very many different techniques whenever it comes to evangelism. But here's the point whenever we arrive at Acts. Though there are many different methods, there, there's many different ways you can do evangelism, there are certain essential foundation principles that undergird every evangelistic effort. So if you want your evangelism to be biblical, there are certain things that have to undergird to, to hold up those evangelistic efforts. So here's your points this morning. I'm going to tell them all to you at once. Truly biblical evangelism involves these. Correct passion. Correct priority. The correct personnel. Taking the correct precautions. And the correct presentation in the right place. There's six things that undergird truly biblical evangelism. Now you're saying, Brother Travis, I showed up this morning because it's Father's Day. I expected to hear a message about fathers. I expected to be recognized as a dad today. But friend, listen to me. As we track verse by verse through Scripture, it's not by accident that on Father's Day 2020, whatever year it is, the Lord would have us studying about what true biblical evangelism is because guess where true biblical evangelism starts it starts in the home it starts by training your children to fear the lord we wonder why evangelism is so hard is because we need to start with those under our own roof there's no point in going out when there's people right there in our own house sometimes so what is these essential traits these essential undergirding foundations that hold up true biblical evangelism, the first is this, and we see this here in Scripture. It's the correct passion. Look in your Bibles at verse number 36. Chapter 15, verse number 36. The Bible says this, 
And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city. Now, last week, if you were here with us, you remember we studied about the Jerusalem Council. So all these people, these church leaders come together to, to settle that salvation was by grace through faith. Last week we settled that issue. But now that that issue is settled, what are they wanting to do? They're wanting to continue reaching out with the gospel. Now, according to verse number 36, Paul is ready to start not only... He's ready to start his second missionary journey. He's ready to continue to go out. And notice what the Bible says here in verse number 36. He said, let us return. See, whenever it comes to evangelism, Paul always had this sort, of, this sort of burden, this sort of passion for taking the gospel to unreached people group. See, Paul was not the kind of man that stayed somewhere a very long time. Because he knew that there are still thousands and thousands and thousands of people out there that had still never heard the gospel. Paul was a very passionate man, and he knew that he had been commissioned to go and to reach, to go after them. He was passionate about preaching the gospel to people that had never heard. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 16, Paul says this, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. In the original language, I mean, he's, he's literally saying, Lord, kill me if I, don't, if I don't preach the gospel. He was passionate about it. Now, here's the application point this morning whenever it comes to evangelism. If you have no passion for lost souls, you're not going to be effective in evangelism. Until you come to a place in your heart where you're actually concerned that people are dying and they're going to hell, your evangelism is going to be void. It's not going to be effective. You must have this sort of internal motivation that the Apostle Paul had. He had an internal longing for the lost. Now, have you ever met someone like this? That doesn't matter where they go, doesn't matter where the Lord's planted them, they still have this philosophy of ministry of, of, of just reaching, teaching, and encouraging. You could put them in a job. It doesn't matter where they are. They have this longing for lost souls. And they're going to talk about them. There's a man by the name of Hudson Taylor. And he was an American missionary to China. And this man, he had that sort of longing for a particular people group. He had a longing for lost souls. Listen to what Hudson Taylor said. Some of you guys may have heard his name before. He said this, I have a stronger desire than ever to go to China. That land is ever in my thoughts. Think of it. 360 million souls without God or without hope in the world. Think of more than 12 million of our fellow creatures dying every year without any consolations of the gospel. Yet scarcely anyone even cares about it. Again, there are certain missionaries and there are certain people that just have a longing for lost souls. And, and, and even whenever it comes to missionaries, there's people that have a certain burden for different people groups. Now, you may be sitting here this morning saying, you know, I don't have that passion that Paul had. I don't have that sort of longing for lost souls to, to go and take the gospel to them. How, how does that happen? How does someone catch that sort of fever. And, and here's how. Passion comes from knowing and, and, and knowing and spending fellowship with Christ. You see, whenever you dig into the Word, whenever you begin to study God's Word, and you begin to know who He is, His passion then becomes your passion. You see how that happens? You see, Christ's passion is what? Why did He come to earth? To save sinners. So when you know much of Him, then that will later on become your passion. So you want to become passionate? You've got to know Christ. So, friend, listen. Effective evangelism starts with passion. So how are we doing? Do we lack passion when it comes to evangelism? When was the last time our hearts were burdened to take the gospel to someone else? Someone that we know is dying 
and they're headed towards a sinner's hell? Are we passionate like Paul? That's the mark of truly biblical evangelism, but there's more than just one mark. The second mark that we see here in Scripture is the correct priority. Not just the correct passion, the correct priority. Look at verse number 36 again. The Bible says this, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. You see, Paul was an evangelist. He loved taking the gospel. But Paul was not like today's evangelist. Paul was different than today's evangelist. You see, the modern evangelist, the evangelist of today, will take the gospel to a city. They'll preach. People will be converted. But then they leave the follow-up. How can we say Leave those converts to be followed up by someone else. That's a modern evangelist. You go in, you preach, you leave. But here, in Scripture, we see Paul was a biblical evangelist. Why? Because Paul understood his his priorities didn't just need to be in reaching. He didn't just need to preach the gospel. He needed to follow it up with teaching and encouragement. And so what does he do? He goes and he establishes new new churches. He goes and he, he, he follows up with teaching of these new converts. Again, look in the Bible here at uh, verse 36, he said, let us return and visit the brothers in every city. His second missionary journey, he desires to go back and retrace the steps of his first journey. Paul understood the right priority in evangelism is this, teaching believers to observe all that Christ has commanded. Now, this is very important. Paul desired for these converts to be mature. He didn't want to just preach to them, then become converted, and then just leave them. Listen to this passage of Scripture. This is Philippians chapter 1, verse number 8. He says this, God is my witness, how I long for you with all the affections of Christ Jesus. And later on he says in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 17, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Paul had something that most evangelists and preachers don't have today. What was that? It was love. Now, how do we know this? You see, many evangelists or preachers today don't take responsibility for their spiritual children. Now, let me explain it. They they could care about, care less about this. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15 says, If you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For I became your father through the gospel. Here's the point, guys. Everybody listening for just a second. Paul viewed himself as their spiritual father. What I mean by that is whenever he came and he preached the gospel, spiritual babes were born in the faith. Now, it would have been foolish for Paul just to drop into town preach the gospel, a bunch of spiritual babes are born, and then he just leaves them. Some people do that physically today, right? They just drop in, a spiritual babe is born, and then they're gone. What happens? All that is left is, is just babes. They're, they're not mature. Well, here in Scripture, Paul sees that. He sees true evangelism is not just bearing a bunch of spiritual children. He sees it important for it him to come alongside them and develop them up into maturity and so that they could then go and bear more spiritual children. You see, spiritual babes in the faith cannot bear spiritual children. What I mean by that is a bunch of babies cannot reproduce, right? Only a mature person can reproduce. Now everybody's cracking a smile, but the point is this. So many times within a local church, we bear spiritual children, but we do not raise them up to where they're mature, where they can continue to reproduce. The point is this. So many churches today are closing their doors because all they have is spiritual babes in the faith. They're not, they're not raising them up. They're not, they're not discipling them. And that isn't true biblical evangelism. That's not the way it's supposed to work here in Scripture. Spiritual infants cannot reproduce. Only mature believers can reproduce. 
And this was Paul's goal. Paul's philosophy of ministry was this. You can find it in Colossians 1 verse 28. We proclaim Him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present them complete in Christ. You don't just come into a church and preach and a bunch of people are saved and you just let them go off on their own. That's not the way churches grow. That's the way churches die. Discipleship has to happen. It's, it's something that, that we see here in Scripture. Paul was not a hit and run evangelism. And it's dangerous in the church. We've got to have follow up. So when we look at evangelism at Raymond Baptist Church, is it hit and run evangelism? Or is there follow up? Are, when someone is saved, are we coming alongside them, training them? Maybe we're good at reaching, but what about the teaching and encouraging part? Do those people know what their spiritual gifts are? Do they know how to, to read their Bibles? Do they know how to pray? Because, friend, it's lacking in the church. And all it's doing is producing spiritual babes. Notice what else we can do to do evangelism well is this. To have the correct personnel. To have the right people. So you see, God uses the right people, the people of His own choosing for His task. And, and this is what we see here in verses 37 and 38. These guys, they're, they're fired up about a second missionary journey, but they come stumbling out of the gate. God's going to use a negative circumstance to produce positive results. Look at verse 37. The Bible says this, Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take him with them, uh, with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So Barnabas is very persistent. He wants to take his cousin with him, John Mark. But Paul's just as persistent back saying, No, you're not, you're not going to take him with us. So, so why? Why was Paul saying no to taking John Mark with him? Well, think about this. Back in Acts chapter 13, verse number 13, John Mark had deserted him. He'd walked away. There was no... Think about in Paul's mind. He's this battle-hardened soldier for Christ. And here this deserter comes in and says, Hey, I'll, I want to join the team. Paul's like, there's no way. You're not going with us. You're just, I won't go there. But the point is this, Barnabas, this loving, caring guy, he wants to give his cousin, John Mark, a second chance. Uh, but look at verse number 39, what, what actually happens here. The Bible says in verse 39, and there rose a, and my translation says, a sharp disagreement so that they separate from each other. Now, again, in the, the original language, this sharp disagreement, uh, it, it literally indicates... a a partnership was dissolved with just bitter emotion, like violent emotion. So when we see sharp disagreement, think, I mean, this is, a, this is a heated, heated argument that's going on here. And so what happens? The Bible says that Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Uh, that, if you guys remember from a few weeks ago, that was actually Barnabas' home. So they go to the house. Uh, they're fed up with Paul. So who is right in this in this disagreement or this conflict, well, scripture in you know scripture never really says who was right in this argument, but it leans more towards Paul. How do we know this? Well, Paul had been given what we call apostolic authority, so he was really in charge in this moment. It should have been um, Barnabas who submitted at this point, uh, but he didn't. Uh, and Scripture also says this is the last time that Barnabas' name is mentioned here in Acts. We don't see his name uh, in Acts anymore. But if you're taking notes, 1 Corinthians 9, 6, eventually uh, their relationships restored. They, they worked things out. But again, let's not get too far ahead. What happens next after these guys split? After this conflict happens? Look in your Bibles at verse number 40. The Bible says, But Paul chose Silas and departed having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. So, to, before we move on to our next point, notice Satan, stri Satan tried to stop this missionary journey. He didn't want the gospel going forward, but God used a bad situation for good. Now, instead of one missionary team that's been sent out, they split. 
and God uses that, there's, there's now two teams. Their impact was now doubled. So you see how the Lord works sometimes? It's pretty interesting, right? Look at verse number 41. The Bible says, And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Uh, so, verse number 41, these guys, uh, Paul and Silas, they are traveling. Uh, if you look at a map, through the Tarsus Mountains, and then eventually they enter through the gates of Cilicia, and they start ministering. And look at verse number 16, or chapter 16, verse number 1. It says, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. Now, here in uh, Scripture, it, it makes reference to this city here that they're in. Uh, this is the same place where Paul went in, began to preach the gospel. They start lifting them up, uh, proclaiming that Paul and Barnabas are gods and uh, he's like, no, 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 we're not. And this, the priest, you remember him? He brought out that uh, heifer, and they was going to sacrifice him to Paul. And I was like, no, we're just, we're just men. And they point the glory back to God. That's that same city. And then later on, uh, Paul would actually be stoned there and dragged outside the city, left for dead. Uh, but notice they're they're back here. And while they're here, in verse number one, uh, they link up with a guy named Timothy. Now Timothy would uh, eventually, in Scripture, as we look through history, he would actually eventually be uh, Paul's right-hand man. And we, we learn that later on. We'll get to that. But uh, something else that you should know about Timothy is he was actually converted on the first missionary journey uh, whenever Paul come here. What else do we know about Timothy? Look at verse number 1. It says, A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Now, why would Scripture give us this sort of commentary here about Timothy's life. The reason why is because Timothy had access to two different cultures. He was, he was definitely equipped for evangelism. He had access to the Jews, but also to the Gentile uh, because of who his mom and his dad were. He was a split-cultured kid, and he was going to be great for evangelism at this point in the church's history. Now, this guy was qualified too. They didn't just pull him off the, the streets. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Now, you guys know the letter that was eventually written to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, gives an indication of qualifications for a, for a pastor, elder, leader in the church. And one of those is to be above reproach. Well, here again, we see it. He's well spoken of by the brothers in verse number two. Uh, so this, I don't want to get off track right here. This is a life changing moment for Timothy. I mean, what would happen by linking his life with Paul at this point? I mean, he's about to go down the coolest roller coaster he's ever seen in his life. Like this would be a life changing moment. He joins Paul and Silas on the journey and uh, it's going to impact his life forever. But let me catch us up. If you want to do evangelism well, we've seen a few things already. If you want to do evangelism well, you must have the correct passion. You must have the correct priority. That's building up disciples. Not just conversion, but building them up. And also personnel. Now that this missionary team has the right personnel to take the gospel, what next? They take the correct precautions. Look in your Bibles at chapter 16, verse number 3. It says, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. All right, so poor Timothy. He didn't realize really what he was signing up for at this point. So he, he says, yeah, I'll join the missionary team. And then here comes Paul with a play knife at him. And so he, he, he literally didn't understand what was about to happen. But what I want us to see right here is this. Paul, and we settled this last week, but Paul didn't circumcise Timothy in order that he would be saved. Instead, he is circumcising him in order to take away an unnecessary stumbling blocks to the Jews that they're about to preach towards. Um, with Timothy being circumcised at this point, it gave him full access to be able to go into the synagogues when, when Paul would preach. That's why that's there. Hold your place, and I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Hold your place there in Acts, because we're coming back. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. There's a point. There's a reason why I'm having you turn. 1 
1 Corinthians 9, verse 19 says this, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. Again, we talked about this a little bit last week, but let's keep reading. It says, To the Jew I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being uh, myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. Verse 21, To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. Now look at verse 22. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. So how does it relate to doing evangelism well? Timothy was circumcised in order that he could go speak to certain people. He did hard things in order that he could take the gospel to them. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor, a preacher, a teacher. It doesn't matter if you're just a lay leader within the church. No matter who you are. There's certain things that you have to be cautious of. Certain precautions that you need to take whenever you're seeking to do evangelism. Now what could that be? So maybe the Lord... Calls a, I'm going to use Easton as well this morning because he's the first person I looked at. Let's say a church calls Easton and says, Hey, Easton, our pastor's left. Would you care to supply for a couple weeks for us? But what Easton finds out along the way, this is a King James only church. And, and, and Easton, I mean, he's seeking to reach, teach, and encourage, and the Lord's given him an opportunity to go speak. Now, if Easton shows up on Sunday morning and just, just lays out his NIV at that King James only church, do you think when people start falling along, they're going to listen to Easton preach? No, that, see, there's already a stumbling block there because of preconceived notions. Now, what if Easton goes and he lays it open right there, his King James 1611 edition, and he starts preaching out of Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God. And I mean, he just lays it out there. Do you think people are going to listen? Why, absolutely they are. See, when we seek to share the gospel, there's certain things that we can do to cause people to stumble. Now, if I was asked to go to Alabama to preach a big game feast, and I show up, and, and, and I'm about to preach at this big game feast, and, but first we're going to do the meal, and while people are eating, I'm going to present the gospel. If I go and I say, well, guys, you know, really... We're seeking to do a gluten-free keto diet, and I just, I really, you know, is there any good uh, spinach that I could just make just a small salad out of? Like, if, if they see me up there with my salad, getting ready to preach, I can already tell you, even as, I'm already tuned out to that guy, because I want to see a guy slapping his mouth with just what gravy everything at a big game feast. There's certain things that we have to be careful of, especially in certain contexts. The characteristics of that culture that we're ministering in, we've got to be careful of it. For example, I threw out the King James, I threw out the Big Game Feast. Um, you probably, you guys get the drift without me giving more illustrations. Again, doing evangelism well, you've got to take certain precautions. There's things that you can do that just completely ruin your grounds to stand on. Someone invites you over to, your, to their house, an unbeliever invites you over to their house, you eat whatever they put on the table. You know, really, I'm just not a broccoli fan. You go shove it down in order that you can share the gospel with them. It doesn't matter. Now, let's keep moving. Number five, the correct presentation. Ultimately, the key to effective biblical evangelism is the right message. Now, the right message that we share is what? It's exactly what the Jerusalem Council was talking about last week. Salvation is what? It's by grace through faith. That's exactly what these men are doing. Look in verse number 4. The Bible says this, As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered what? They delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. So the, so the churches were strengthened in faith and they increased in numbers daily. They're spreading that same message, message that salvation is by grace through faith. In verse 5, we see the effects of biblical evangelism and discipleship. What happened to the church? It began to grow. I mean, it, it sounds simple, right? Make converts. 
and raise them up to maturity. That's what grows a church. Growing a church isn't just getting a bunch of people in to make a profession of faith. Because then you're just going to end up with a big nursery, right? A big spiritual nursery. We need to raise people up again to maturity. Scripture, again, we see the goal of evangelism is not to rack up many converts. It's to build mature disciples. Man, to me this is super convicting. You know, this fall, 11 years I would have been in ministry. Or I will be in ministry if the Lord gives me a few more months. I can tell you, just in complete honesty, those first couple years, I had this wrong. It was all about converts. Just, just preach the gospel. But it wasn't until a man come along and said, hey, what about the teaching and encouraging side? How about we raise them up? And so, again, I, this is why I get fired up on this subject, because this is something that I did wrong. And I don't want anybody else to do it wrong. I want us to be marked by it. Uh, building up mature disciples. I want myself to be marked by that as well. Notice our last way uh, that we do evangelism well is this. We do evangelism at the correct place. Look at verse number 6. It says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So Paul decides in this missionary journey, hey, I, I think I'm going to take the gospel west. I mean, he's made it up in his mind. And that's important. The gospel needed to be taken west. And eventually it would because there's different churches like uh, Smyrna, Ephesus, Laodicea, Colossae, Thyatira. All those churches would eventually be planted west. That's a good thing. That was a good desire for Paul to have. But guess what happened? God had different plans for the missionaries. The Bible says they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the gospel in Asia. Why? All right, so the way west was blocked, so what do they do? They start going north uh, towards Mysia. But what does the Holy Spirit do? He blocks that way. Again, what you see, they go west, a door is shut. They decide to go north, a door is shut. But what do they do this whole time? They keep moving. They don't, they don't just sit on their hands. I mean, there's an important principle here they knew as long as they kept moving god would eventually open doors look at verse number nine the bible says this and a vision appeared to paul in the night a man of uh, macedonia was standing there urging him and saying come over to macedonia and help us this is important like as we're doing evangelism sometimes doors will be shut but but we don't just stop Maybe you're you're seeking to share the gospel with a family member and the door just shuts. What do you do? Well, you head in a different direction. You share the gospel with somebody. Well, that door shuts. Okay. The point is this. You keep moving until the Lord opens a door. We're called to be faithful, not to produce results. And that's exactly what Paul does here. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to head towards your invitation, I promise. Now, when this vision, as verse number 9 is described, it says, hey, go here um, to Macedonia. Do you know what would happen if they obeyed this call to go to this other place, the third place they try to go to? This would be the first time the gospel is taken to the continent of Europe. I mean, that's pretty glorious, right? The first time the gospel had ever been preached there in the history of man. And so what happens? What does Paul do? Well, he doesn't hesitate. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says this, And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to him. Guys, again, we're heading towards invitation, but continue to proceed forward. If there's closed doors, just, just keep going until the right opportunity is reached. I pray you're encouraged in your evangelism this morning. Maybe for years you've been doing evangelism wrong. It's just about it's just about sharing. But you've dropped the ball whenever it comes to actually building mature disciples. Guess what, guys? There's grace there. And so what what do we do is don't say, well, if we would have done this different, we wouldn't have been here. Or it, it, the point is there there is grace. And so what well, even as a father, there is grace this morning. Maybe you look back over your life and you you. you your children knew how to be saved. And maybe they made a, a public profession of faith. 
But what happened along the way is you forgot about the teaching and encouraging part. Your children grew up. They never were taught the spiritual disciplines. There's grace there. So you ask for forgiveness and you keep plowing. You don't sit on your hands. I want to pray for us because, you know, I, I told you guys last week, we're going to hopefully come together and do uh, the Lord's Supper here in just a second. But the Bible tells us in Scripture that we're not to partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So if there's sin in your heart, if there's unconfessed sin in your heart, you need to repent of it before you partake. True repentance is turning from sin and turning to Christ. It's not like, well, I'm sorry, Lord, but I'm going to go back to this after the service. No, true repentance is, is leaving it there, saying, Lord, I, I can't do this on my own. There's no way I can stop doing this sin. You're going to have to do it for me. So that's what needs to happen right now, guys. Does everybody understand? We've got everybody looking at everything else besides the most important part of the service. And that's doing business with the Lord. All right, I want everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. Everybody's looking around. I encourage you just to think about things. Evaluating your evangelism by these truths. Are you passionate? Passionate about what God's passionate about? Or, if, or have you lost that passion along the way? It could well be because you're not spending time with the Lord. Your passion is about what you desire, not what He desires. Repent of that. Maybe you're here this morning and you've not taken necessary precautions when sharing the gospel. You're like, well, I am who I am. I'm not going to change. I'm going to do this. Well, maybe the Lord wants you to do something a little bit different in your presentation. That's okay. There's thousands of different techniques out there. The message doesn't change, but techniques can. Well, Wherever the Lord is leading you this morning, whatever unconfessed sin that's come into mind, I encourage you to repent of that and cry out to the Lord in faith. Lord, thank You for this time that You've given to us this morning. I pray that You'd help us to do an internal checkup in light of what Your Word says. Lord, Your Word says You're faithful and just to forgive us of all wrongdoing. Lord, we thank You that if that reality is true through Jesus Christ, well, I pray that Raymond Baptist Church would be marked by true reaching, teaching, and encouraging. And Lord, the day that we stop that, I pray You'd take us out. As Paul said, Lord, just, just kill me. If I'm not going to preach the gospel, take me out. Yes, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.